Okay, so welcome everyone to our Edible Leeds Libraries Culinary Collection Talk. This is part of the Heritage Open Days Festival, and I will now pass on to librarian Helen Skilbeck, who will tell you some more about the items in our collections. Thank you, Louise. So I'm going to be talking about a couple of items we have in our collection at Central Library. Um, apologies if I sound a little bit echoey. I'm in Central Library itself, found myself a quiet space, but it is quite an echoey room. I'm aware I can hear it. It sounds a bit weird for me. Um, but we're going to get started on the first item I want to talk about. And it is uh, going to be the bread archway. Now this is, I think, the most edible landmark Leeds has ever had. It's an archway made of real loaves of bread. And despite the image on your screen saying 1895, the archway was actually built in October 1894. Now, this is actually a print we have in our collections. It's a calendar for the year 1895. And you'll see that W. Morris, the baker, is very prominent on this uh, particular print. Now, this archway was built to commemorate the visit of the Duke and Duchess of York, who would later become King George V and Queen Mary. And they were coming to Leeds to open part of the Yorkshire College. And the Yorkshire College we now know as the University of Leeds. And they would be staying at Temple Newsome House. And then in the morning, they would make their way by carriage into the city centre, drive around a few streets in Leeds, make their way to the town hall initially, and then up to the university area. So there was great excitement in the city. A lot of the streets they would be traveling in were decorated with a flag and bunting. There were Venetian masks um, put up, embellished with shields and trophies. Tramway poles had colored flags on them. There were flowers and streamers and other archways made of flowers and garlands all over the city. Now here's a slightly enlarged version of the bread part of it. Now the idea of a bread archway came from the landlord of the Mitre pub, which was on Commercial Street, and he was called Henry Child. And his friend, Mr. Morris, a baker in Lands Lane, had the idea to make an archway of bread that would stretch across Commercial Street from the Mitre pub to the premises of Mr. Edison opposite. And they were very serious about this. They employed an architect, Thomas Wynne, who helped to plan a frame of wooden iron to support all the bread. The loaves baked were extra large in size, around two and a half feet long, weighing about eight pounds. And it's thought there are about 1,500 of them used to actually build this archway. Uh, there were also decorations at the top, wheat sheaves, and you'll see a G and an M for George and Mary there. The whole thing was uh, thought to weigh about five and a half tonnes and was 25 foot to the very top of it. Here's how the Yorkshire Evening Post noted it, the 5th of October, 1894. So you'll see their little drawing of the bread archway there. And we also have a photograph on our Leodis website that was only put on there in the last year or so. And you'll see if you can compare the two, the print we have and the photograph on Leodis, very, very similar. There were a few alterations, a bit of artistic license, but this was really how the archway looked. Now, on the day of the royal visit, there were a few mix ups. The royal carriage didn't turn up at Temple Newsom House. Uh, so after waiting quite a while, the royal couple then had to take one of the Temple Newsom estate's own carriages into the city centre. So we don't know whether they actually saw the bread archway or not. It was certainly wasn't a road they were going down, but they should have been able to see it from Brigham if um, they had enough time really. Now, this is a picture of the royal party before they came into Leeds, so while they were at Temple Newsome. So you'll see um, to the right of the screen, we have Lady Maynor Ingram with her favourite dog, Valletta, sitting on her lap. And then to the left of her, the Duchess and standing behind the Duke. 
Now, there was a further unfortunate incident in Park Row uh, when a man ran out from the crowd to their carriage. He opened the door and attempted to get in, and the Duke reached out to shake his hand, but his lances were quick to act, and the man was quickly removed, somewhat trampled underfoot. He wasn't seriously hurt and was taken to the town hall and determined to be Joseph Thackra, who was 33 of Armley, and he was found to be of unsound mind. Now, it also rained that day. Um, and then the next day, the archway was taken down. Apparently, some young boys had stolen some of the lower level loaves during the night. But the bread, along with packets of tea and soup, were going to be distributed to the poor the next day. And tickets were given out to the local clergy members who would then distribute these to the poorest parishioners. So if you turned up the next day with a ticket, you could get some, some bread and soup. And we actually have um, a kind of bill with all the total costs involved with this archway. And just a slight enlargement there. So you'll see six tons of bread, 600 gallons of soup, uh, more bread because they had they actually ran out of bread from the archway so they had to go and find some more bread um, and some sausages and tea is also noted on this invoice now not everyone was a fan of this archway idea so i did find a letter in the evening post saying sir will you allow one voice to protest if not too late against the erection of an arch of bread it would certainly be grotesque, probably hideous, and undoubtedly vulgar. Such a proposal would be impossible except in a provincial town. Yours faithfully, and signed it anti-vulgarity. So moving on to my next item I wanted to talk about. It's this rather plain looking item that was donated to the library a few years ago. And it's rather unremarkable. It has nothing written on the front or the spine at all. But when you open it up, you see that it's pages and pages of handwritten notes. And it forms um, a ledger. And it's a fascinating glimpse into the history of Leeds. Now, what we know about this came from this newspaper article, which was inserted inside this ledger. And this dates from the 7th of September, 1945. And it explains how this ledger fell into the possession of Harry Child. And he was the son of Henry Child who created the Bread Archway. And he at this time was the owner of the Mitre Hotel. And it explains that this ledger be belonged to Mr. Godfrey Wood of Wood's licensed confectioner's shop, which was also in Commercial Street. And it covers the period 1842 to 1876. And Mr. Wood was a caterer. He um, catered for many special events in Leeds, whether it was weddings or huge banquets. Uh, he also employed Adolf Pavoni as a chef who would later found a famous restaurant on Bond Street. So inside the ledger, we have various handwritten entries. On the left of your screen, you'll see an actual table plan for a wedding breakfast. And this was for 28 guests at 12 shillings per head. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's a bride at the very top of the table at number five. And there's also a bride at the very bottom of the table at 27. So this was a double wedding. And I did look this up in the local newspaper and actually found that it was a wedding for Elizabeth, who was the daughter of William Gott of the textile manufacturing family. And she was marrying Robert Nairn of Berkeley Square, London. And the second marriage was Caroline Brooke, who was the niece of William Gott and granddaughter of Benjamin Gott. And she was marrying the Reverend John S. Warren. And the local newspaper called the occasion the most gay and fashionable weddings. The brides were in their magnificent dresses. The bridal parties occupied eight carriages and crowds flocked to Leeds Parish Church to see them. And the actual ceremonies were conducted by the Reverend Dr. Hook, the Vicar of Leeds. Afterwards, the whole wedding party departed for Denison Hall, home of William Gott. Now, these other two examples on the page are for 1856. Wood provided a wedding breakfast for 28 guests at 12 shillings per head at Mr. Burnley, Gomersall. 
And then December 1856, he provided Captain Gunter at the Leeds Barracks with a ball, supper and tea, coffee, ices and biscuits, etc., for 100 guests at 10 shillings per head. Other things you can find listed in this ledger include a supper at the assembly rooms in 1846, where you could have soup, beef, ham, tongue, veal, pigeon, turkey, pheasant, chicken, potted salmon and shrimps, puddings, tarts and ornamental dishes, jellies and raspberry creams. The Lord Mayor of London's visit in 1854, which see you having crimped cod, turbot with lobster sauce, York ham, leverets, peel and snipe cheesecakes, and cabinet pudding, which is the illustration below. And the laying of the foundation stone of Leeds Grammar School in 1858 would have turtle soup, lobster patties, fricasseed rabbits, hot apple pies, Wood was also called on to provide teas, coffees and meats, as well as finding tables and seats for 224 boys and 106 guests. And he apparently assigned one bottle of wine for every eight boys, as well as 24 bottles for the guests. And we actually have the, um, a ticket of admittance for this ceremony in 1858. This is included in the ledger. There's quite a few things pinned in the back of it. But most impressively, Wood catered for the banquet for the opening of Leeds Town Hall. And this was in 1858. And this was when Queen Victoria visited Leeds to open the Town Hall and to knight our Mayor, Peter Fairburn. So you'll see that this is uh, providing a banquet at the opening of the Town Hall Leeds on Tuesday the 7th of September 1858 for 274 guests at 17 shillings per head. The Mayor Peter Fairburn to provide tables and seats and wine. 34 musicians would have dinner and ale and everything would be cold but the soup. And he actually includes the menu for this banquet as well. So a lot of it is in French we don't necessarily know what these dishes looked like, um, but we can see that there were things like potage de tortue, cuisse de boeuf, rimolade italienne, jambon de york, jelly à la Danzig, and eigenbatten tort. Um, so any food historians out there that would want to do any research on what these things actually were, what they would look like on the table, then please do let us know. Now, some of the most interesting parts of the ledger concern the notes that Wood leaves for himself about events. So in 1850, uh, the mayor of Leeds, Mr. Bateson, was supplied with a stand-up supper and tea, coffee, ices and dessert for 369 people. And Wood lists all the waiters that he uh, needed to employ for this event. One of them includes the drunkard. No name, just the drunkard. And Wood would also provide food for these musicians as well as for 20 policemen. And then in 1851, the mayor of Bradford was provided with tea, coffee and biscuits for 300 guests. Afterwards, a table was set out with biscuits, fruits, ices and jelly. And Wood makes a note that 10, bo 10 dozen bottles of wine were needed rather than the mere four dozen he provided. And there are various other bits and pieces in this ledger. So we have an example here of the Railway Foundry Festival, which took place in July 1847. And this is a, a ticket for admitting a lady and a gentleman. What I like about this particularly is it says dinner at five and a half o'clock. And then finally, we have another menu for another event at the Town Hall in Leeds. This one's for the Lord Mayor of London's visit. And again, we have a, a whole list of food that was provided for this actual event. So this uh, ledger I find fascinating. Some of it is difficult to understand because of the handwriting, but these little menus and tickets really give you a sense of some of the events that Wood was catering for. And they're fascinating for anyone researching food history or researching big events in Leeds and how they were actually catered for and the costs involved. 
So I have come to the end of my part of this session. So I will stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Rianne Isaac, who is going to continue talking about edible items in our collection. Thank you, Helen. I'm just going to share my screen. And here we go. Thank you so much, Helen. That was really interesting. I always love hearing about the bread arch and the catering ledger. And I'm going to stick again to a 19th century theme. Um, and what I really enjoy about the cookery books and our collections is that there's such an important part of social history, finding out who was writing what and for who and how tastes and trends changed over time. So just to show give me a bit of a feel for what Leeds in the 19th century was like. Um, so a lot was changing during this time period and this really had an impact on what people ate and what they cooked. And my first item that I'm going to talk about is Food and Home Cookery, which originally was published in 1879. And I've chosen this book because I think very few people have probably heard of the author, uh, Catherine Buckton. Uh, but she was an amazing woman who lived in Leeds and she was passionate about women's education, suffrage and social reform. And she was in fact the first woman to be elected into a public office in Leeds, paving the way for many other women since. Um, she was a founder member of the Yorkshire School of Cookery and the Ladies' Council of the Yorkshire Board of Education. So really busy and important person. Um, but what Catherine Buxton was really interested in, um, she was aware of the really terrible living conditions in industrial cities like Leeds. And she recognised the urgent need for public health reform. Um, so there's a lot of kind of uh, what we could relate to today really as well. Uh, she believed that the education of girls was vital in improving the lot of working class communities. And so this is linked as well to kind of changes in education. And in 1870, the Elementary Education Act gave all children the right to education up to the age of 13. And school boards were set up to do this. And this was huge. I mean, there's 20,000 children just in Leeds um, alone who had access to education. And property owners could vote to elect the board members. And for the first time, women property owners could also vote and stand for office. And this gave Catherine Buxton a real opportunity to make a difference. In 1873, she was elected to the Leeds School Board and remained the only woman until her retirement. And she was a real committed person um, to the education of girls and especially to be taught cookery and she volunteered to teach the classes herself and she drew up her own curriculum bought the ingredients herself and she even designed this traveling cooker um, which you can see in this picture here this is an engraving that shows the girls at their lessons and food and home cookery the book where this engraving is from is a book of her lessons and once the subject was finally accepted onto the curriculum, her lessons became the template, not just for Leeds, uh, but for most board schools across the UK. And she was encouraged to publish them in print form and was even published in America. So it just shows quite how influential she was, um, but many people don't really know much about her. I'll just show you some examples of the lessons, which are really interesting to look at. So the lessons were given fortnightly and the girls could take home printed recipes to share with their families. And the book is divided into 19 different lessons and it includes all different sections from bread making, roasting and cooking um, and even cooking for the sick as well, which was an important aspect of this. And the end of each lesson concluded with a series of questions to be answered at home as well as a recipe to take away. I'll just go back to the full page engraving, let's have a look at it again. So this shows the girls at their studies and a typical kitchen grate. And then yeah, the adaptable storage cupboard is just in the corner as well. And this book really resonated with me as recently there's been so much discussion about food poverty and food banks and access to food. But Buckton's work really recognised that there was many different factors that meant that people couldn't necessarily eat healthily or have access to nutritional food. For example, such as lack of garden space, which many people who had moved into the cities from the countryside were experiencing, um, lack of space in their kitchens and also just knowledge. So these girls were probably the first generation to have a cooker in the home. Um, 
and the girls would most likely be living in one room. So some of the lessons around being neat and tidy uh, might seem quite old fashioned to us now, um, but it was such a necessity at the time. And Buxton clearly saw the link between nutrition and public health and developed this really practical cookery book um, that was adopted not just in Leeds, but much wider afield. Um, so it's a really important little book, I think. Um, so please come and see it if you ever get a chance in the library. And then I'm just going to move on to one of my favourite little books. And this is in the local family history departments as well. And this is moving away from the inhabitants of the city of Leeds to more of the factories and industry that was drawing people there in the 19th century. Um, and I've always been quite attracted to this little book um, by the Leeds company, Goodall Backhouse and Company, the makers of the famous Yorkshire Relish, which was the best selling bottle source in the Victorian era. And to me, it captures a lot of the ideas of consumerism, mass production, advertising and branding um, that were really becoming prevalent during this time. So the company was set up in 1858 by chemist Goodhall, Backhouse and Powell. And by 1874, Goodall's was the largest source factory in the world, which is pretty amazing, really, but, you know, something that was produced in Leeds. It was steam powered and occupied a six storey building in White Horse Street, Leeds. And this is a picture from Leodis, which shows the building. And the book itself combines traditional recipes, which you can see here. But of course, all of these recipes can be improved by the addition of Yorkshire relish, advertised as the most delicious sauce in the world, um, or one of Goodall's other products that they made. So you can see that the soup can be improved by a bit of Yorkshire relish, We've got gravy and even salads, they're saying, a bit of Yorkshire relish can improve it. And so this was a book that was probably given away free as a marketing strategy and the adverts for their products hidden within the recipes. And this competition grew between lots of companies at this time and they tried to tap into lots of new consumer markets. This led to lots of marketing tricks and the Victorian innovation was um, including these kinds of adverts in the front and end pieces of books. And Good Things has a typical kind of good example. You can see the adverts for pear soap and fennings. So these are found just in the front of the back of the book. So it's not just a marketing book for Goodalls, but it's also marketing for other companies at the time. Just a look on the next bit. And so Goodalls invested heavily in their marketing and advertising and spent around 40 to 50,000 pounds a year. And this drove sales up from 670,000 bottles in 1872 to 13 million in 1907. So this is a huge amount of bottle source. And this helped establish a brand that was well known across the world. But there was a bit of a downside to this. So as they become more popular and uh, more well known, uh, other companies tried to take advantage of the famous name and tried to pass off their own version of Yorkshire relish. And Goodall found itself embroiled in a lengthy trademark dispute um, against the Birmingham Vinegar Company, who had begun to match their own Yorkshire relish. How awful. And Yorkshire Relish was one of the first names to be registered when trademarks were introduced. And this, you can see on the slide here, is the trademark which you can find in our copy of the Trademark Journal of 1877. And you can imagine after spending so much money on their branding and advertising and building up their reputation, you can see how they really wanted to protect their trademark and their product. So what was Birmingham Vinegar? Uh, company, what did they claim? They thought that Yorkshire Relish was just like a descriptive name, just like a tomato sauce or something. Um, and scientists actually were enlisted to disprove this. And they found that the composition of the two sources were significantly different. So Goodall's won the case and it was so significant that even in trademark disputes today, this case is still cited. So it's amazing just in one little book, you can get some of these different stories. And also bottle sources during this time just showed how food production was adapting and changing to meet the needs of a growing urban population. 
people weren't so close to where food was grown a lot of the time and so they needed new ways of storing and transporting food across the country and even across the world. Innovations like bottled sources contributed to this as well as adding flavour to what could sometimes be quite a plain diet. And you can see on this recipe here stewed oysters and at the bottom it says that few can indulge in stewed oysters now that oysters are so very expensive and so it even suggests buying canned oysters from the United States and Canada. So these means that food was traveling huge distances and really shows the change in scale at this time. But of course, this leads to something that was much, you know, that we have um, a lot of awareness today is the huge packaging and rubbish that was created um, relating to the mass production of food. So we had a sneak peek of my next slide, I'll move on. And so just to finish from my section, I'm going to just show a bit about how the other half ate. And this links quite nicely to what Helen was talking about with the banquets and the food. So these are a selection of beautiful 19th century menu cards. And these, along with some other invitations and memorabilia, were donated by Af Alfred E. Matthewman, a sister who had a senior role in the town clerk's office, which is probably why he was invited to all these wonderful banquets and dinners at the town hall. And we can clearly see some of the differences between the food that was produced for these banquets to what was produced in Mrs. Buckton's recipes and the Goodalls. This is a much higher scale, um, much fancier for different class of people. Um, so there's fashion for French food we saw in what Helen was showing us as well and so there's no explanation of what the food actually is so it assumes a knowledge of French language and the fashion for food French food was encouraged by lots of celebrity French chefs at the time and so we see a completely different kind of scale of food here and these are mostly for events held at the town hall and hosted by the Lord Mayor and included dinners for the Leeds Corporation, as well as welcoming international guests from China, Persia and the British colonies. And so you can see a mixture of um, local delicacies like Yorkshire ham, which I think we've seen before as well, as well as other kind of different high French cuisine. And so just to show that these different books are very different in what they were showing. Um, but I think we can catch a glimpse of a 19th century city through its relationship with different foods and different cookery books. And how some of these sometimes very unassuming items um, could communicate how well people ate, how they spent their money. And in case of these little menu cards, actually communicate the power and prestige that a city like Leeds was trying to communicate to the world. So that's my section finished and I'm now going to pass on to Anthony. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> brilliant. Thank you, Rianne. That was great. Um, I'll just share my screen. <clears throat> OK, so um, hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, let me know if you can't. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Anthony, a librarian in the Local Studies and Research Department here at Central Library. Uh, and I'm going to be jumping from the 19th, uh, as we've heard about, um, now into the late 20th century. I'm going to be discussing a few items from our stock collections linked to the subject of modern, aka craft beer. So more uh, potable than edible, uh, but still part of this general theme of food and drink uh, in Lee's history. Uh, the items I'm looking at have kind of integrated into a, a short narrative of developments and themes in the subject, uh, illustrated where I can buy those materials but also including some photographs from our image archive, Leodis, and a few newspaper articles, a couple of other bits and pieces as well. Uh, I have to say that had we been doing this in person as was originally intended, uh, I've had all those items in front of us. Um, as it is, I've not had access to lots of the ones or items I was hoping to look at. So I've had to kind of improvise in some cases and use similar images uh, from the internet, but the, but the sort of general gist is, is the same. So now to begin. Um, Leeds, of course, has a, a long and venerable history when it comes to brewing, uh, stretching back to at least the brewery uh, installed at Kirk's Abbey's foundation in 1152, plus evidence of brewing at the Temple Newsome estate in the 18th century, which was the subject of uh, an exhibition there about three years ago. 
they're much more familiar to us today are, of course, um, names like Tetley's Brewery, uh, formed in 1822, though the Tetley family's links with the brewing industry stretched back even further into the 1740s. So this is quite a very sort of long history. We've got uh, nearly 300 years. Uh, we have a small but quite interesting collection of Tetley's material at the Central Library, which you can read more about in the leaflet on the screen. We can provide you with copies of that if you are interested in seeing more or learning more about some of those materials and just ask us uh, if you want to come in. Tellys, of course, was taken over by the Carlsberg Group in 1998. And today, however, beer in Leeds is much, much more associated with independent breweries like uh, North Brewing, uh, Northern Monk, uh, the Kirksell Brewery, uh, Wild Child, and a, a whole host of others around the city, its suburbs and its towns, from Farsley to Methley, all across the city, really. And most, if not all, of these uh, will be described in some way or other as being part of this craft beer movement uh, that has become increasingly popular over the last 10 to 15 years or five to 10 to 15 years. It is hard to say exactly when craft beer emerged, either nationally or locally, um, partly because this is much less of a, a kind of a revolution, as it's sometimes called, a much more kind of gradual shift in taste and provision. Um, Book and Bailey's book, Brew, Brit Brew Britannia, which is a fantastic history of uh, beer in the UK, uh, makes that point very clear. We've got a copy of that in the library. There's a lot of really interesting Yorkshire and, in fact, Leeds uh, material in that book. Um, but probably most people will recognise craft beer when they see, or at least recognise the difference between that and, and, and other kinds of other kinds of beer. Um, Particularly, uh, the things that get pointed to with it is emphasis on sort of independence, independent producers, uh, and experimentation in terms of beer styles, and a very deliberate focus on the quality and the provenance of the ingredients, particularly hops. Hops play a really big and important part in craft beer. Uh, Leeds, in fact, had already played a, a quite large uh, role in the development of craft beer. Um, Michael Jackson's classic 1977 book, The World Guide to Beer, uh, is often credited with kick-starting a more serious and intellectual approach to brewing, having, and this is a quote, a special influence on the popularization of the brewing culture in North America, which is where craft uh, beer and craft brewing is, is usually said to have begun. Uh, and interestingly, in this context, uh, Jackson was born, I think he was born in Weatherby, but he was raised, uh, raised in Leeds. So that's a really interesting local connection to to what has become a kind of worldwide movement. But why uh, though did craft beer more properly emerge in the UK, uh, even if we can't say exactly when this happened? Um, well, many authorities do point to Gordon Brown's progressive beer duty, uh, which was um, introduced in 2002, which massively cut taxes on the first 500,000 litres of beer produced uh, each year but only for breweries producing less than 3 million litres per year, uh, which did give this, gave smaller, what are called microbreweries, a huge competitive boost. And in fact, all the Leeds breweries that we associate with this movement did launch after that 2002 date. Many of them, in fact, not really until the next decade into the 2010s. And there is some evidence at the closing of the Carlsberg Tetley Brewery in 2011 played a part in these developments. Um, Mike Hampshire, who's a kind of a Leeds beer evangelist, um, has said uh, the single key turning point in Leeds beer has been the closure of Tetley's Brewery in 2011. As sad and difficult as it was, it effectively hit the reset button on the Leeds beer scene. The US craft revolution was well underway and lots of microbreweries started popping up, seeing the huge gap in the Leeds market for traditional ales and US influenced modern styles. Um, that quote is from a really interesting article by uh, the aforementioned Burke and Bailey um, uh, on their website, a kind of oral history of modern beer in Leeds, um, which, albeit, which although is not um, technically part of our collections, um, you'll note if you go to the article, it will say that it was prompted by a comment that somebody made on Twitter uh, in 2019 saying that they would like to see a kind of longer history of beer and uh, craft beer in Leeds. Uh, and, and that person was in fact myself. So I think we can claim this as part of our collections, even if it, uh, even if it technically isn't. Um, 
So to move on, um, it's also, I think, as well as that kind of 2011 um, uh, um, closing of the Tetley's Brewery, I think it's also of really great importance, possibly even more important, that a, a kind of grass, grassroots infrastructure and community was already in place in Leeds to support those breweries, both in terms of places open to selling those kinds of beers, but also perhaps even more importantly, in terms of a knowledgeable consumer base with a pre-existing interest in and regular exposure to relatively exotic beers. And this was a uh, very fertile soil with its roots deep in the uh, early 1990s and attempts to create what has been called, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, a European cafe culture uh, in Leeds. Um, beginning around 1992 with the opening of uh, Indie Joe's Cafe in the Victoria Quarter, uh, and then the uh, legendary arts cafe on Core Lane in 1994. Uh, Leeds was slowly developing the infrastructure of a bar scene that was increasingly far removed from the image of the traditional northern boozer. Uh, these are places that were far likely to be serving cappuccinos, single glasses of wine or uh, European beers uh, than pints of tetley, uh, tetleys rather. Uh, and it was from this scene that the true starting point for the Leeds beer renaissance emerged, and that's uh, North Bar, uh, often called the country's first craft beer bar for its emphasis on a wide range of worldwide beers. Uh, Cra um, North Bar opened uh, in July 1997 on New Brigate, where it can still be found to this day. It uh, interestingly replaced the hardware store with the um, atrocious name, quite frankly, of Knobs and Knockers, uh, a shift that I think probably says as much as anything about the way Leeds City Centre has changed over the last 25 to 30 years. North Bar's owners didn't in initially intend the bar, certainly in its very early years, to focus uh, on exotic beer at all, really. Uh, the drink was supposed to just be part of a whole package, similar to the Arts Cafe, a European-style bar where you could feel as comfortable ordering a cappuccino as another pint at nine or 10 in the evening. But the bar became increasingly focused on beer, uh, led in part by the demands of its new consumer beer, customer base, uh, to the extent that North Bar soon began incorporating uh, increasing numbers of imported beers, uh, particularly the kinds of American beer styles that drove the craft beer boom. Uh, and alongside North Bar, Leeds was also very fortunate to have another institution that opened at pretty much the same time as North Bar did, that's now sadly closed, and that's uh, the Headingley Beer Shop Beer Ritz, which opened just a year after uh, North Bar in uh, 1998, uh, initially just online, uh, but they, uh, a physical presence soon after that, a year or two later. Um, uh, until its closing, it was often fated as the longest operating specialist beer bottle shop in the country. Uh, and the store was another huge influence on the development of modern beer trends and tastes in Leeds. In fact, and this is, I think this is a really interesting story. Um, one of the most influential of all uh, local craft beers was initially brewed in 2011 in the back room at Beer Ritz, uh, Rooster's Baby-Faced Assassin. Um, and together, these two venues, uh, and this is almost certainly simplifying things uh, a little bit, and these two venues made Leeds a kind of beer, a beer lover's paradise. Uh, not just a place to get drunk, but a city where the connoisseur could truly enjoy and discover a wide range of beer styles. Uh, and this kind of 20-year history uh, created the, the cultural space for craft beer and breweries to flourish in Leeds. So much so that by the 2010s, Leeds was hosting two major craft beer celebrations, uh, Leeds Beer Week and the uh, Leeds International Beer Festival. But I think beyond that sort of very specific local inheritance over the last 20 years, we might also think about what Leeds already had place in terms of a, his, uh, a, a, a longer historical inheritance. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about Leeds' long history of brewing, but what was also important was that Leeds, like many other post-industrial cities, had, had a, a huge amount of kind of dormant physical spaces, which were perfect for reinvention in the sort of, um, uh, you know, um, consumerist age from the sort of 1990s onwards. Uh, like the flax store that was part of the old Marshall's Mill uh, in Holbeck, which um, Northern Monk operated from. 
Uh, and interestingly, in fact, uh, Northern Monk, probably as much as any of the other modern Leeds breweries, play quite self-consciously with their place in Leeds uh, and West Yorkshire's industrial and cultural heritage uh, in quite a creative way. Uh, they frame themselves quite, again, quite self-consciously as the heirs to innovators such as John Marshall, uh, for instance, their uh, 2017 Beer City of Industry, which you can see on the right, uh, pays tribute both to John Marshall and the men and women who worked in his mills. And speaking of Northern Monk, um, another way they've sort of um, uh, connected themselves to sort of local heritage, uh, in 2018, um, they brewed a really interesting collaboration beer um, uh, to tie in with that Temple Newsome exhibition that we mentioned earlier, and which was, <laughs> which was inspired by a 1736 uh, recipe for what's been called a pipe of pale, strong beer. Um, Kirkstall Brewery, too, do much the same thing. Uh, their name is a deliberate revival of the 19th century Kirkstall Brewery of the same name, though unconnected to the modern brewery of that name. Um, their flagship uh, dissolution uh, IPA um, pays uh, hom homage to the uh, nearby abbey with the, with the branding on, on the bottle. Um, talking of collaborations, Kirksell Brewery have also regularly collaborated with uh, partners from around the city. Um, from uh, North Bar itself, for a time they brewed the house pale ale prototype uh, to recent ventures, very recent ventures, in fact, uh, um, uh, this was picked up for me in uh, Morrison's just yesterday. Um, this uh, a collaboration with a local street artist, uh, Burley Banksy. Collaborations, in fact, are at the heart of the craft beer movement. Um, something we've already touched on with that uh, very brief story of beer Ritz and the Roosters beer, Baby Faced Assassin. Some of these collaborations are between different uh, breweries, uh, whether locally, like the one on the screen now, which is a tie up between Holbeck's Northern Monk and Farsley's Amity Brew, uh, nationally um, or even internationally, like this North Brewing beer from last year, which was a collaboration between breweries worldwide to support hospitality professionals during uh, the early stages of lockdown. But some of the most interesting of those collaborations, I think, are the ones that in fact cross sort of what we might call cultural or creative disciplines, um, both illustrate and at the same time, in fact, generate a sense of community among independent creators in the city. Whether that's a collaboration between a brewery and a football fanzine, or a collaboration between brewery and a local coffee producers, one between a bottle shop, a brewery, and a comic book shop. That's one of my favourites, I think, actually, just for the sheer number of different collaborators and the, and the in fact, you wouldn't normally connect to those three uh, um, institutions, but they've been able to do that through this, through this medium of, of craft beer. Um, those between uh, breweries and local artists, um, between breweries and restaurants, um, and also not to mention the fact that the designs of the cans themselves mean that breweries regularly draw on the efforts of other local creatives. Uh, North Brewing's eye-catching cans, for instance, uh, are put together by local design studio Refold Designs, uh, run by James Ockel Ford, who is in turn creative partner for Leeds Beer Week itself. So that I think, um, in short, uh, what we have here is a whole creative ecosystem that's grown up around or been pulled in by this local craft beer industry in Leeds over the last 10, 15, 20 years, stretching back to the sort of late 90s. And in this sense, I think Leeds craft brewers, bottle shops and bars are merely the latest in a long line of local innovators at the heart of national and international networks of trade and ideas. Uh, they demonstrate the city's continual powers of dynamism and self-renewal, all sitting within a culture of mutually supportive cross-pollination, drawing on the city's history and heritage in food and drink, and in the process becoming an important part of the lead story themselves. And that's it. Um, our contact details are on the screen, should you wish to contact us about any of the talks or the items uh, today. Thank you for listening. And now, um, hand you back to Louise. Hi, Anthony. Thank you so much. That was, that was really, really good. Um, I'm going to ask Helen and Rianne to turn their cameras on because I do have some questions that have been submitted. Um, so I'll start with Helen. 
was this the only bread arch Leeds ever experienced or was bread, were bread arches a thing? It's the only one we've got um, kind of any prints or photographs of. I think there was one in Rothwell called a bread arch, but I don't think it was made of actual bread. Um, this is the only one I've seen. Um, arches were quite common themselves, so you would get quite a lot of them for big celebrations and big visits, but it's certainly the only one I've come across that's made of real loaves of bread. <laughs> very, very bizarre. I still love the story. Yeah. I must admit, I did love the letter signed anti-vulgarity. I mean, do we know, did anti-vulgarity write into the paper often or is this the first I reference you found? I don't know. It's the first one I've seen. So whether whether there was a kind of a, a cause that anything he didn't like, or she, I guess. Um, but certainly we don't know who that was, but someone was very anti the bread arch being built. I hope they wrote in more often. Um, and then when you were talking about the catering ledgers and you had the menus, why do we know why they were in French? I think it was just the fashion of the time, as, as Rianne was saying, the kind of like the higher levels of society. It was very much the fashion to have your menus in French, to have that kind of European theme. A few of them were actually in German as well. And then you do get the odd few words of English. So I think on one of the menus, suddenly it said roast lamb in the middle of it. Um, okay. So it, it's a real kind of combination. But, but as Rianne was saying, it, it had some kind of expectation that you would know what this was, that you would recognise these dishes and have an idea of, of what these foods were. Whereas we now, in the 21st century, have not got a clue over most of them, I'm afraid. <laughs> fancy food for fancy people. Yes, okay. indeed. Um, Rianne, going on to your section. You've read some of these recipes. Um, are they realistic or do you think they're so old that they're maybe one or two steps back from something you could recreate in a modern kitchen with ingredients from your pantry? I think because the whole point of these books, especially the Goodall's one and Buckton's, and even if you look at Mrs. Beaton's, they're all of that kind of appealing to kind of either working or middle class. And it's all about practicality it's got to be easy to do easy to recreate so I think you probably could redo that they might not be particularly to our taste um what you see a lot of is kind of kind of convenience type food so instead of like fresh lemonade you might have like a powder or like I think Goodall's did like a ginger powder or something to add to make you drinks um so yes yeah, so maybe it's not to our taste but I definitely think they could be recreated cool. There's one in Mrs. Beaton's where she says to boil your pasta for an hour and 45 minutes. Oh, so there's some really odd things, that's, but it's definitely doable. Yeah. And it's um, a few years ago, we had an exhibition where the chef from White Locks actually did recreate some of the recipes. And so it was quite interesting. Cool. Um, is the Mrs. Buckton, is that something still in print? Could you order it today or are there... Is it just these heritage copies? I know what you can find a Mrs. Beaton's oh, pretty yeah. much anywhere. Mrs. But Beaton's, what about, I think it's been out of print. Yeah. But what about Catherine Buxton? No, I think because it was so specialist, it was all about being in the classroom, teaching those girls how to cook, um, that it's not something that would be kind of for a wider public now. But definitely okay. come and see it in our collections. Yeah. And finally, um, do we know, was there a patent for her travelling cooker that was her own design? I mean... She clearly wasn't just a cookery woman. She was an engineer, so to speak. So I'll need to have a look, but there must be something be because it was her just, yeah, her idea just to meet that need of space and practicality. OK, thank you. Um, Anthony, would Leeds craft beer movement have taken off had Tetley stayed in the city? In I your opinion? I, I don't know. I don't I don't I don't honestly know enough. <laughs> about the specifics of that i can't see has, that has anyone questioned that or asked that? a lot of that claim that yeah has anyone wondered um well funny enough i only came across that claim the other day um and i've seen it repeated just today in something else um so it, and, and the, the other source that i read it today was actually something written by um, one of the founders of, of North Bar and North Brewing. So it, it's obviously something that's on the minds of people in the in the industry as a as as some a turning point. But the two things are so distinct 
the kind mm. of beer that Tetley's Carlsberg were making or are making and the craft beer styles yeah. that I'm sure the two things could have coexisted. I mean, the venues that like North Bar were never serving Tetley's anyway. So there's a, yeah. I'm sure the two things could have coexisted. I, I don't know. I think that's something that you'd have, you'd have to go and ask all the people who launched those breweries and, f- and find out what their mm-hmm. motivation was and whether the, what impact that really had it's a really it's a really convenient um sound bite i think but whether it holds up like under yeah. scrutiny i don't know the thing that the thing that i actually think is potentially uh slightly more interesting and i nearly mentioned this in my talk but i cut it out because i couldn't evidence it at all was whether people who had been working at tetley's carlsberg um both the people and potentially even some of the equipment what happened to that sort of technical know-how and and the physical infrastructure and whether that and those people then went on to work for or advise people who were setting oh. up microbreweries. And that, I think, is potentially a more, a more interesting... Yeah, that'd be a really route. interesting question. Mm. Um, I just have a, a memory of my own to add to here. You mentioned the Leeds International Beer Festival that's grown massively and is huge at the town mm. hall. I remember going to the first one, and I don't think they realised how popular it was going to be because they had three members of the Leeds to Council events team behind the counter with scissors cutting up the tokens. So they had to buy tokens and they just clearly not anticipated how popular it would no. be as they were not even a guillotine or anything. They were, I'm surprised <laughs> they weren't handwriting them. They were clearly running yeah. them through the photocopier and cutting them up as fast as they could. <laughs> okay, well, that's brilliant. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions coming through. So I am going to end the recording there. Just give me a moment. Um, There we go.